Hi guys, I'm going to make a video for you today on kimchi. This is something that I eat quite a lot of and make quite a lot of and just love it. It's uh, Here it is here, it's a, a cabbage based dish. It's, well it's not really a dish, if you've had it in a Korean restaurant it's a little side dish, an accompaniment to a main meal. Uh, it tastes amazing, it's really good for you. Um, it's got all the good stuff in it, you know, cabbage, as I said, chilli, garlic, ginger, onion, apple, uh, carrot. Yeah, it, and it's uh, it's obviously being fermented, it's, uh, it's good for your gut. Uh, makes people like me eat cabbage. I mean, my memories of cabbage are always horrible, steamed, slimy, smelly cabbage, but this is nothing like that at all. So if you like spice and you like, and you and you don't eat cabbage maybe, or you do eat cabbage, you should give this a go. It's super simple to make. I just do it in my uh, bog standard kitchen with bog standard kitchen utensils. Uh, it's uh, best. I mean, best thing I can like it to is like sauerkraut on steroids. That's that's how I feel about it. Anyway, I'm gonna show you how to make this super easy recipe. Uh, let's get started. Have you done? Have you hear that? That's uh, my favourite station at the moment, Digital Soul Radio. Love those guys, uh, you know, great music. Disco, soul, funk, house, you know, it's all all good stuff, gets me through the day. Anyway, onto the equipment. So starting off with the, the main jobby, it's the this is the fermentation crock or sauerkraut pot. Um, the original Korean version is is a similar thing, earthenware jar gets buried in the ground and you know that gives you the sort of cool dark conditions that are ideal for making kimchi. So this works probably pretty much as well. But you know you don't have to invest in something like this, just regular old jam jar will work fine. The only real difference between this and that, aside from the volume, is is the ceiling on the top. So this one's got a moat, a water moat in it which allows the CO2 that's coming from the fermentation to escape, but doesn't allow water in. So because the inside is gonna be under pressure at some point and it's gonna start bubbling out. And this one is obviously got a rubber seal on it. So if it's super tight like that and you leave it long enough, it probably will explode. So um, it's a cheap alternative, works absolutely fine. All you've got to do is just even leave it just ever so slightly cracked open so that, you know, Air can't get can't really get in or you just we call burp it every few days just undo it every now and again you'll certainly smell it when you open it up right I use uh, a builder's bucket for mixing stuff up just because the volume that I do this is a five litre pot uh, so I'm gonna need a bucket I can't bother with dealing with bowls I haven't used this to mix up mortar and you know this is just purely for uh, making food uh, we've got a measuring jug, food processor, chopping board, and a sharp knife. So that's the gear. All right, so the first ingredient is salt. This is kosher pickling or sea salt. What you don't want is cheapo table salt. And there's a reason for this. If you look on the bottle there, you'll see it says anti-caking agent. Uh, sometimes you'll get iodine in these things as well. So, and either of those things react uh, in the fermentation process and it can, it can change the colour and the flavour. Some people don't like that. So you need to spend the money on good quality salt. Uh, there's, there's two or three reasons why you even need to use salt in the first place. One is that it's gonna, it's actually a safety issue. So the, the, the bacteria we want is on the leaves of this cabbage and they can survive in a very salty environment. Whereas other like funguses, molds and other bacteria like botulism or, you know, some really undesirables, they can't live in the salty environment. So that's the reason why we need salt. And the other reason is because if you were to just put these leaves all chopped up into you know some sort of liquid and left them they you know go all mushy and kind of remind me of those days those horrible days you know when we used to 
boil cabbage to death and it was all slimy and saggy and horrible but because you put salt in here it draws out the moisture from the leaf and makes it a, a bit stiffer so yeah this you know it really does improve the texture so those are the two reasons to use salt next thing is obviously the cabbage and i've just got a quick look at my crib sheet i can never remember the name yang yang bai cho is, is the korean name for this kind of cabbage b a e c h u in the west we would call it western green or spring or cone-shaped cabbage there might be some other names but essentially what you want is a smooth leaved green cabbage you don't want purple cabbage and you don't want the crinkly one which i think is the savoy it, it, the texture is just it's horrible then we've got two white onions two small white onions uh 16 spring onions in america i think you call them scallions or welsh onions there's probably loads of other names eight cloves of garlic six inches of ginger three sweet apples of any variety and 20 24 carrots 24 carrot gold 24 carrots and then this stuff which is essentially what makes kimchi what it is so this is called gochu garu uh g-o-c-h-u-g-u-r-u is that right gochu garu yeah no g-o-c-h-g-a R U. Not to be mixed up with gochujang, which is a paste, or it could be made out of this stuff as well, but for some reason or another, you need to use this stuff, which is essentially chili flakes, whereas the other stuff is, is a paste, comes in like two litre tubs. It's cheaper as well, a lot cheaper. But they, they recommend you use this stuff. Now this stuff comes from Korea, specifically. It's, it's a unique chili. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only one that's smoky, sweet, and spicy, whereas others only have those single elements. What I would like to do is to somehow grow this myself because, I mean, you can grow chilies. Some of the hottest chilies in the world are grown in the UK, believe it or not. But all these ingredients here are British, all right? Apart from, so it'd be, this, this stuff, so it'd be great if I could, you know, do everything like UK based. So I'm just going to do a little side video on how that might be achievable, but yeah, that's, that's all the ingredients you're going to need. So I've been having a little think about uh, an experiment I could do to make my own version of the gochu garu, right? So there's two types of, of this. I don't know which one this is, but there's the Taiyang Cho and Chion Yang. So those are the two different types of gochu garu you can get. The Taiyang Cho is 1500 scovilles and the Chion Yang is about 10,000 scovilles. If you know anything about chili and spice, you'll know the scoville is, is just, you know, it's like a scale of, so the higher the number, the spicier it is. And you get some seriously hot, like million scovilles and all this sort of stuff, you know, these crazy uh, Scotch bonnet ones or whatever. I would assume this one's the, the more spicy one because it is quite quite tangy. But it's got these three key elements, right? It's sweet, smoky, and hot. That's what we want. So what you could do is combine, I think what you could do is combine two different types of chili to make up something similar to this. But you don't really get natural, apart from this, you don't really get naturally smoky flavored chili. You've got chipotle and paprika, which you probably know about, but those are smoked chilies. They're not, that's not the name of the chili. That's a smoked version of the chili. So for example, chipotle is actually smoked jalapenos. That's about 5,000 scovilles. Uh, then you've got the Spanish, the, the, I, you know, there's lot, lots of chilies out there, but I looked at the cayenne pepper, 30,000 scovilles, probably too high. Depends what you like though, you can go with whatever, whatever heat you want really. Spanish guajillo. Oh, I need... I'm t I've got all sorts of languages going on, I haven't got a clue how to say them. G-U-A-J-I-L-L-O. That's 2,500 to 5,000 scoville, so we're in the sort of right sort of range, you know, between 1,500 to 10,000. And then you've got the ancho, 
wherever that's from, 1000 to 1500 Scoville. So, mix one of those spicy chilies with uh, paprika or chipotle. Then you get your, your heat and your spiciness, uh, your smokiness, sorry. So, I'm gonna give that a go. Any ideas, suggestions from you guys, please put in the comments below, but you know, I'm trying to make my own version in the UK and obviously we can't grow everything here that we want. So I would imagine it's going to be paprika and probably cayenne pepper or, or this Spanish one. So yeah, let's give it a go. So all we're going to do is cut it up into two inch cubes roughly. And some people keep the heart in, I cut it out. Uh, some people even just cut this into quarters and then just shove the whole thing in and then I mean that's a traditional way of doing it You cut this into quarters like that. So another cut there and then you would just chuck the whole lot in and eventually once the things fermented Then you cut it up into little bits, but I, I'd rather just do the process now. I just Don't want to be messing around again with messy kimchi so Just gonna cut the heart It's just too too tough really I don't really enjoy it it's gonna get composted anyway so that's fine that's gonna be my little compost bowl there for vegetable cuttings and so forth Cut up however you want really, I guess mine's not two inch cubes, it's a bit smaller than that, but I don't I don't really enjoy big chunks of cabbage. Right, that's gonna go into my into my builder's bucket. What you want to do is actually keep one one leaf aside. This is just to help hold the kimchi down. Just put it in there for now. Uh, when you put it into your fermenting crock. You see I'm not a chef. Now we need to mix the salt and the water together to mix with the cabbage. So we've got our cup of salt. We're going to need 24 cups of warm water. This is three cups. So we're going to need eight, eight of these. Stir those together and pour it on the cabbage. Try and dissolve that in there and then I'll add I'll add the rest of the water. Oh, it feels like all the salt's gone. Give that a stir.
keep that weighted down and we leave that for 24 hours so it's been 24 hours and we've got our cabbage soaked in there if you're making another batch of kimchi you probably want to reuse this water because obviously quite a lot of good good quality salt in there seems a bit of a waste but I'm not and I'm not gonna throw this on my compost because it's, it's quite high concentration of salt so probably would kill a lot of my plants so we're just gonna just gonna first of all drain it off Helps have a few containers. And it it just it feels ever so slightly softer than it was. Slightly more rubbery. This is a result of the salt drawing the moisture out of the leaves. I'm just going to put that back in there for now. And then we're going to start making up the paste to go in there. Start preparing the the paste now. This is largely carrots. Ironically, did you know <clears throat> that carrots store most of their well, fruit and veg stores most of its fruit, uh, its nutrients in the skins. But that's also where pesticides end up. So, because these are not organic, unfortunately, I'm removing all the all the goodness as well as the, the badness. But yeah, I guess organic would be ideal. I'm not going to worry about the skins on the apples, but anyway, you've got you've got the reasons why you should cut them off. So now we can blend up the paste. Right, twelve, twelve of these. Right, and then we'll just put that on top of the the mixture of other vegetables to make the paste. So you can see that a jar like that's gonna last you quite a while considering the size of the batch I'm gonna make. Okay, you're gonna need a bit of water because we we'll try to make this paste and it'll be quite dry as it is.
that's that's ideally what you want. It's kind of like a moist moist paste. Okay. So I'm just gonna pop that in there. Assuming you haven't blended these up with the, the other ingredients. It doesn't matter if you have, it just it's just to give it a different this is the you know the traditional way of doing it, it's just to give it a different texture. So you're just gonna chop these up and they're gonna get thrown in in little pieces. Cut these up however you want, really. I'll throw it like this. That's all going to get mixed in with the paste and the cabbage leaves. So these are all the final ingredients to go together now. I literally just, I'm just going to mix them all together. You could even eat it at this stage. You can eat it fresh, you know, there's nothing that's going to harm you in here. It's just. It'd be better to leave it. Because then you'll get all the benefits of the bacteria and the, all the healthy benefits of that. Alright, lovely. So that's going to go straight into our. Crock. Pretty easy to do it by hand. But you do want to squash it down inside there. Because we don't really want, we want to minimise the amount of air that's in there. making too much of a mess, just sort that out afterwards. It's the last, last little bit.
at this point you could use the leaf uh, but somebody in my family threw it away <laughs> but anyway I don't really need it because I've got these stones but it's just another way of trapping because what we're going to do is top this up with water and then you put the leaf on and then the leaf would hold the solids below the, the surface because it's the solids that are going to get the mould if they're in contact with the air okay so again we don't we don't really want see like even that it's bits of food isn't it so try not to push and push that down shouldn't have pushed that down so far it's sitting all right like that okay and we're just going to top that up with water Because that's quite close to the top, there's a good chance that as it all starts to ferment, that it all bubbles up over the sides. So that's why I'm going to wash up the bucket. And we need this round here to be clean. Place this in the bucket. So now we can pop the lid on. You see how, how little air I've left in the top there. I was, I was no point filling it all the way to the top because I know the activity would just spew that liquid straight over the edge and mix in with our clean water moat which we're about to create. So you just fill that up. What that's doing is creating a, a seal that will allow the gas which is under pressure inside, well it will be under pressure when it's building, and it will, the bubbles will be able to come out through that moat of water. But you can't, air can't go back in. Obviously pressure only works in one direction, so that's how that works. So now where do you store this? Well, most recipes will tell you, and bear in mind this is a Western uh, recipe, you then store that in the fridge. Now, here's one I made earlier, Blue Peter moment. This is, this obviously the size of this jar, I can stick this in the fridge. And what you're doing is mimicking the the traditional way they make kimchi, which is to take a, an earthenware jar, something like this, even bigger, and they bury it in the ground, which is going to give you a constant cool dark conditions of probably about 10 celsius throughout the year sometimes a bit colder in the winter so by sticking this in the fridge it will still ferment but you're slowing down the fermentation if, if you left this out in the summertime it's going to go crazy and if you didn't unscrew if you just accidentally left this lid on just slightly tight the jar will probably explode whereas with this one as, as I explained, uh, you got the, the gas that can release from here, so it's not really an issue with this, but you will get a massive mess. So you want it to ferment, but slowly. So, and uh, it should be ready in about two weeks to consume. You can leave it up to two years. If you do that, you're gonna have to add more salt to prevent spoilage, because you're leaving it that much longer. So in a Western household, in a modern Western household, where do you put this thing? This is a, a dilemma I've been facing with a lot of storage of things. So, small jar, yet yeah, fine fridge, but big one like this. Best location I've found, and this is not gonna work if you've got an eco home, right? Because you've insulated the whole building. But if you haven't, and you've got a cold exterior wall, that's where you wanna put it. So, I'm just gonna take you to those places now. 
Right, that's, uh, that's a cupboard in my kitchen that's facing the outside wall. And I know for sure that it's cold up there because sometimes I get problems with uh, mould and other things. I know it's not ideal, but it's definitely cold in there. And then the other location you might find is the under the stairs, which hopefully you won't be using much. That's an outside wall down there and you know, a th very thin carpet in there, so it's pretty uninsulated on the floor as well. So that's, and I've measured it. I mean, that's the coolest places in the house, without a doubt. Don't stick it in the loft. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's boiling hot. But just finally, guys, just a couple of things to watch out for. Uh, one is that I've found that this, this little water moat in here sometimes gets sucked inside the vessel, which is, not ideal that has to be something to do with the pressure changing or the temperature changing I spoke to some sauerkraut gurus and they reckon that I, I haven't figured this out in my head how this works but if you put a little stone in the moat and break the meniscus of the water that will stop that but I'm not sure that has helped I think it's something to do with fluctuating temperatures and the other thing is when you think about it, what you're going to be doing with a big vessel like this is you're going to be transferring that into a little jar like this each time you want to consume it. And then, which was what I was doing, putting this back in its location, putting this in the fridge and then just eating that and then fill up another one. But the problem is, as you imagine, the level in here is going down and down and down. So the volume of air in there is getting more and more and more. And I found it spoils really quickly. And you, you, can, you can mitigate it to some extent, keep topping up water, making sure everything's kept under the surface. And not only that, it's messy every time. If it was me, I would leave it as long as you want it to ferment, two weeks or a month or whatever, and then just transfer the whole lot into jars and stick them in cold storage, uh, sealed, with the lid sealed. Because once it's in the fridge or cold, it's not gonna be fermenting quickly enough that it will they'll explode. You would have done, all the fermentation would have been mostly done. So, yep, that's that's my tips, guys. And looking forward to a couple of weeks' time. Stick a label on there so you know what date you've made it, and we'll open it up and have a little little try in two weeks' time. Cheers. So, just pulled this out of the storage. We're only on about day two now, but just to show you that. As I said, the activity in there has just increased the level of, of liquid in there. doesn't physically make much sense because how can you create volume? But anyway, I knew that would happen. So now that's right at the top there and it's all floated into here. So I'm going to have to give that a clean out and it's all gone in the bucket as well. So just going to, so every few days, just check it and, you know, put back some clean, clean water in the moat and then just loops do its thing. So it's the moment we've all been waiting for. It's been two weeks. Can't wait any longer. You could if you wanted. Get the stones out now. So all I'm going to do is decant it essentially into my glass jars now. I'll make a bit of a mess but it is what it is. Look at that, lovely. So remember this is still still fermenting, still live. It's probably done most of its major fermentation, but you know, <clears throat> just bear that in mind. That's where we're going. And the same as when we were putting in here, you need to pack this down because, like I say, essentially it's going to carry on fermenting. You just don't want any air in there, really. But as, obviously, as you start consuming it, it's going to go down and down. But hopefully, you'll eat it quick enough that it won't it won't spoil. 
So we're just going to pack that in there, screw the lid on and stick it in the fridge. That's it, job done. I mentioned how kimchi is obviously a Korean dish, often you'll have it as a little side dish, but look online, there's loads of recipes out there. I think one of the key ones is kimchi pancakes and kimchi fried rice, so gonna give those a go, and yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> 